Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to do a quick recap via using this video of the Kuiper Belt and the Oort Cloud. Now, those of you who were in class the day before we went into dismissal, you probably will find this very familiar. It's basically the same lesson. For those who are distant learning or any who were absent last Wednesday, I believe it was, that was the last B day we had in presence with each other. Um, those of you who are absent, you'll find this a very handy lesson to, uh, to have delivered to you to explain these two strange regions of space. Okay, so we start with the Kuiper Belt and move on to the Oort Cloud, but let's start with what caused us even to start thinking about these things in the first place. Take a look at this image right here. You've got an object flying through space, shedding gases and particles, dust behind it as it flies. So something about that object is different. Planets don't do this. Moons in general don't spew gases out into space. I apologize for that. Um, it's just reminding me to give a lesson. Yay. So um, quite a bit we took for granted for a very long time until until scientists like Jan Ort and um, Gerard Kuiper started reasoning through these objects have to come from somewhere. If there were just the ones that were nearby the Earth and the other planets, they all would have been melted by the sun or gobbled up by Jupiter, anything but continuing to see more given the age of the solar system is about four and a half billion years. They should all be gone. Where are they coming from? And that gave us the idea. And we started looking for evidence and they started finding it. Quick review back. Dwarf planets, right? You did page 26 and 27 in your book. And you've got these two uh, pages covering the dwarf planets. The next step is the zone where quite a few of them hang out. Take a look at this place, the Kuiper Belt. So I'm going to move my little picture here to a place where you can see the full page. This is what page 28 and 29 in your book are going to look like. On the left side, your sketch of um, the uh, Ort, I'm sorry, the Kuiper Belt down here below show the planets and especially the outer one, Neptune. And then I would include Pluto because Pluto is the innermost of those Kuiper Belt objects. Pluto's friends, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of them, hang out in this place called the Kuiper Belt. On the right-hand side, way over there, on page 29, you're going to put down what it's made of, how many objects are there, what they're like, um, whether our solar system is the only one or are they fairly common, look up anything else of interest, and write down a little bit about the belt at the bottom of the page. Include your sources and you'll be done with 28 and 29. All right, let's go through this. Um, all right. Kuiper belt objects, or KBOs as they're called, um, number in, well, as you can see by this computer scan of objects that are theorized and confirmed to be out there, they're pretty numerous as they make their way around the sun. So the sun's gravity holds more than just the planets. It holds all these comets and icy objects like Pluto and all his friends in their own orbits. Okay. Now let's consider not just where they are, but how they behave differently. So where they are, is 30 to 50 AUs away. That is far away. From that distance, the sun itself just appears as a very bright star in the distance, the brightest of all the stars, because it's still just 30 or 40 AUs away. But no longer does it appear as the round disk that we see in the sky every day. The further away you get, it vanishes down to one very bright, intense point of light. But its gravity, even at that distance, still pretty strong. They still feel it. Okay, so the icy objects there have different moons. They are bright. Some are bright, some are dark. Some have atmospheres, Pluto with an atmosphere, and others don't. Others, the atmosphere is frozen solid and settled back onto the surface. Others have seasonal atmospheres, like Pluto. Part of its orbit, part of its year, right? Uh, the hundreds of years it takes, 248 years, I think, um, 
part of its year, it has an atmosphere, and then it retreats to further away in its stretched out orbit, right? And when it's farther away from the sun, the atmosphere freezes and settles onto the surface. Kind of interesting. So let's take a look at one particular Kuiper Belt object. This is Triton. You've already met Triton when we talked about Neptune, okay? So Triton could very well be a lot like Pluto, an icy round object, much bigger than Pluto actually, Triton, and it orbits as a moon of Neptune, probably a captured Kuiper Belt object, okay? Because it similar in composition, it hangs out at the edge of the Kuiper Belt, and it was gravitationally grabbed by a gas giant and when they came too close, and it's in a stable orbit ever since, okay? Now let's talk about some others you know about. Pluto, we're all familiar with. Eris, goddess of discord, right? That's another Kuiper Belt object, one of Pluto's friends, slightly more massive than Pluto is Eris. We've talked about Eris as well in our dwarf planets unit. Okay, so this scattered disk, think of it as a donut shape going around the sun beyond Neptune, but still within the gravitational grip of our solar system still bound by the sun. All right, now let's take a step further away than just the dwarf planets, the icy objects in the Kuiper Belt. Let's take a look at this, this comet, for instance. Uh, churyumov gerasimenko Yes, named for the, no doubt, um, uh, Russian uh, astronauts who discovered it, or other Slavic nations. And it looks kind of like a lion, but it's one huge icy chunk bonded together with another huge icy chunk for a very lopsided um, comet. Look in the middle. Look at the, the where the lion's mane ends and his back begins. See the jets shooting out into space? Those are geysers. Because when it's close enough to the sun, those geysers, the comet heats up when it's inside the orbit of Mars or thereabouts. And those geysers blast water out into space. And on this comet, they managed to get actual video footage of what it would be like to stand at the edge of that cliff and see the geysers erupting from slightly outside the picture frame, and then the snow rains back down. Two things I'd like you to watch in this video. Actual footage from the surface of this active comet. Look in the background for stars shifting and then it resets. It, it's very quick animation. The stars move, and the snow, the geyser snow, is falling back onto the surface. Check this out. You could see the entire star field shifting as one unit in the background, and in the foreground you see this crazy dance of ice particles because of the comet's gravity pulling its own geyser material back down to the surface in the form of these little ice crystals reflected in the light, um, distant sunlight, and also the light of the uh, camera sensing what's going on on the surface of this comet. Pretty crazy. Gee whiz, Sandrock, you found a cool video about what it's like to be on a comet. Why should we care? Well, these things keep coming. They keep appearing more and more over time. They're not running out. Where do they all come from? So between the Kuiper Belt and the Oort Cloud, this scattered disk extends out really, really, really far. And by far, I mean half a light year away. So let's take a look at the very edge. We're talking the frontier now of our solar system. Here's an artist's impression of just a chunk of ice in orbit, distant orbit, at the edge of our solar system, somewhere way beyond where we will ever have a hope of seeing it. That's why it's an artist's impression. There's, it's impossible to get a picture of an object this small. It could be the size of a city, or it could be the size of Africa. Okay, um, it's, it's a chunk of ice floating out there at the edge of the solar system. But is it alone? Take a look. That cloud, that spherical cloud engulfs the entire solar system. In a moment, I'll give you a sense of scale, how big that cloud actually is. Okay. So if we were to look at, take a look here. I'm going to put my picture right next to it. Okay, so right there, you see the gas giants, right? There's the gas giants, and you see the tan circle 
is the orbit of Neptune. Okay. Now look above me now, and you see that the uh, they, they've changed the colors. The blue is actually the orbit of Neptune now in that one. The tan, the uh, gray color is Pluto. The red one is Eris, and we're still take a look what this entire disk is right here. Okay, so right there, right here next to me, that little white oval is the entire Kuiper belt for scale. So the sun is now just a pinpoint of light at that place, right? And the cloud itself goes out one half light year in all directions around our solar system. This cloud is immense. A trillion comets are in the cloud. But if you were to stand on the surface of one of those comets, you would find it quite impossible to see even the next comet over because it's such a huge distance out there at the edge of this circle. It's like an ant standing on an elephant and one is on his back and the other one's on his trunk. That Neither ant would be remotely aware of the other one's existence because they're just too far away, even though they're the right next to each other. They're the closest neighbors they can be. So each object, each comet, if you will, in the Oort cloud is at least as far away from each other as Earth from Saturn to its nearest next door neighbor. So it's a cloud we know exists because all the evidence tells us it's there, but it's impossible to get a picture of it because we're talking tiny little chunks like vapor chunks, if you will, at that range, it's almost like trying to see the vapor from someone's breath on a cold day, right? It's, you can see it briefly, but to see it at that scale would be virtually impossible. All right. So when you do your research on these two, I encourage you, as you build your pages, take a look in the description below of this video. I'm going to have two videos, uh, links for you to watch. First one, Kuiper Belt. Second one, Oort Cloud. Watch them both. Each one's about two minutes, three minutes. I'm not wasting your time, I promise. And it'll really give you a good insight to what these two regions of space are all about as we finally reach the very edge of our solar system. We've done it. We've reached the edge of our solar system. We're ready to finish up chapter one of our book out to page 35, right? 31, 33, 35, okay? And then we're ready to begin look beyond. That'll be our very next step. So for this page on the Oort cloud, page 30, I would like you to sketch the cloud itself. It's a sphere, okay? It's known to be a sphere, mathematically calculated to be so. Make sure you include the cutaway you see in the picture over there on that side, right? way over there, and uh, include the lines and the numbers, include the labels, because all of those are valid descriptions, visual capture of what the Oort cloud really is. And then on the page 31 here, the description, describe what it contains, how many objects are there, have any of our probes ever reached the Oort cloud? I can give you an answer to that one right now. Voyager 1, Voyager 2, the farthest out, the fastest moving objects are barely starting to get to the inside edge of the Kuiper Belt. They're passing through the Kuiper Belt. They won't reach the Oort Cloud for another 12,000 years. They won't clear the Oort Cloud and get beyond it for 70,000 years. Holy cow, that's immense. So from one side of the cloud to the other is like a light year across. That's a big cloud of comets, okay? So you're gonna write down who it's named for, a guy named Jan Ort, look up the spelling, don't guess, look up the spelling. Distance from the sun, it says in the picture here, out to 100,000 AU, you could say it is basically a light year from one side of the sphere to the other. And then write down your sources and you'll be good through chapter 31. Once you reach that point, my friends, you're done through chapter 31, or page 31 in your book, Start taking pictures, send them to me so I can put grades in the system. Please don't wait until October 8th when we're back in school and then start showing me stuff. Don't wait until then to get it done. By that point, you'll only have eight days left 
that I can actually take any graded work. You don't want to pile up your work toward the end of the quarter and then you run out of time. Do it now. Please knock it out now. Get done through page 31. Take pictures with your cell phone. Send it to me through Canvas messaging or through an email or save them as a Google Doc and invite me to edit so I can just see it and give you credit. All right. Okay. So this concludes our discussion today. Don't forget, chapter check 1B out to page 31 is due this week. Yes, we're not in school. I still want it done this week. Get the work done so it doesn't sneak up on you and pile up at the end. Okay, so this has been our look at the IC objects of the solar system. I want to thank you for tuning in. Pay attention for more videos. I'll post another one probably within a day as we start considering not just what's nearby, but we start really thinking big. And you're going to build page 32 and 33 of your book. So watch for that lesson, that video, and the guidance on that one coming very soon in another video. All right. Thanks for watching.